Good afternoon again. I mean, what I'm going to try and do today is to talk about achieving stakeholder involvement. Um, and I start by really describing what I think uh, we should be doing today. It's about identifying our stakeholders. And it's about exploring different levels of management. And it's about involving them in what I would term a sustainable partnership. I hope that at the end of this session, participants would be aware of who their stakeholders are. They would understand the different levels of involvement. And these levels of involvement is what will help our organization to grow. And participants would also be able to deploy different mechanisms to keep their publics, to make sure that their publics stay close to them. Okay. Stakeholder involvement starts with a clear statement of the values of the organization and the various arrangements that the organization has and the policies that it has for working with stakeholders. The organization has to build an effective mechanism so that it understands the impact on the stakeholders. And it's also important that the standards of service provision are kept fairly high. Not only that, these standards of service provision have to be communicated to all the stakeholders. There's monitoring to ensure that there's consistency and inclusion and there's work with the stakeholder and other stakeholder-led organizations to improve the quality of the offering. Stakeholder involvement also allows for an open door compliments and complaints policy, which means that whenever there are issues, we have an avenue for external arbitration. Some of these things are normally captured in a quality statement, okay? What I'm trying to find out from you now, as the session is started is, who are your stakeholders? I'm hoping that Dara is able to divide you into groups for 10 minutes for you to come up with a list of all the stakeholders after you've held a discussion. Dara, is that possible? Yeah, so I'm going to assign everyone a breakout room now and you have about 10 minutes to discuss this and then you'll get a 60 second countdown before everyone gets put back into the main session. So I'll assign them now. I hope that that exercise was useful to all of you and that uh, you all now know who your stakeholders are. What I'm going to try and do is to attempt uh, to list the stakeholders from our session who we found to be stakeholders. Ah. If you look at this slide, this is us, the organization, with our staff and volunteers right in here. And we have our members and our users just abutting what it is that we're doing here. And there are other providers who are providing to our members and users. 
and our regulators are supervising us as well as supervising our other pro providers. And we have our founders and commissioners here. And this yellow bit is the wider community. So essentially, we have these different type of stakeholders for whom the organization has to work with and for whom the organization has to achieve full involvement. Okay. So let me try and describe what involvement is about. There's a gentleman called Hart who did some work about a youth program. And what he tried to find out was to what extent the young people were involved in the project. And he came up with different levels of, of involvement, eight different levels. And he said that there was a level that the youth were just told what the project was about. Um, and then there was the next level, there were a couple of youth who sort of hung around in the development of the project without any involvement. So he called that stage also that they were decorations. And then he found in one of the projects, a youth member who was actually on the board, but he just said he was a representative without any actual tax that he needed to do. And at the next level, there were some people who were there. Um, they knew about the project, but not too, too well. And then the next level, people who were consulted and informed. And then at the next level, they found out that the project was actually initiated by adults. And after they initiated the project, they shared the decision with the young people. But then the very good projects were the projects where they found out that the youth had initiated and were involved as directors of the project. And the ultimate was when the youth had initiated the pro project and then shared the decision with the adults. So if you look at this ladder of involvement, this was refined by another lady called Anstey, who developed what she called the degrees of citizen participation and moved out again from the point of manipulation to the point where the citizen control. And she said that if you really want a project to work very well, then you need to design that project in such a way that the uses are very much in tune with all the stages of the development of the project. Okay. I'll reflect this in another slide, which, which actually says that there are probably different types of involvement. There's one when the involvement is the management. We want people to be involved. We create the structures. We get the users to come and participate. And what we do is that we consult with a few people who we already know. And that is contrasted with another view which says the objectives and priorities are set by the users and adopted by the organization. And people are free to voice their opinions and participate in decisions. And obviously we know that that user-centered project is actually a better project would run in a better way than the one that is management-centered. Okay. This is important because really the issue of our involvement is very important. And we discovered that there are different barriers that make it difficult for us to reach full involvement. For one thing, we may have a mix of service users. Somebody wants 10 minutes, somebody wants three hours of our time. So they may hold different views. 
our leadership may be skewed towards either being very paternalistic in doing things for everybody or being fairly authoritative without being participating. And then obviously, there are situations where the service users are not that knowledgeable about the project itself. So you don't have somebody there who is an expert, but they just use the project. And they are, it happens in a lot of advocacy projects where people just come along, okay? And then sometimes it's fashionable to have users involved without really involving them, which is really what the to tokenism comes about. And the most dangerous one, actually, is the involvement of a few suspects. Because although they are supposed to be people who open gates for other users, invariably, sometimes they become gatekeepers and they prevent other people from actually coming into the project in the way in which that makes it a problem. Continuity issues always happen. One person gets replaced by another person. And I'm sure we find that in a lot of mainstream organizations where they have a black person as a director and then they decide they want to replace that person with another director. So involvement needs to be geared towards the users. But what I'm suggesting is that there are barriers to involvement, okay? And so I'm gonna ask another question, but I'm going to now let you work for five minutes. Why is stakeholder involvement important? Dara, can we do a breakout again? This time, give them five minutes. Yeah, that's fine. I'll do the breakout rooms now, I'll open them now. Thank you. I hope you had a nice time thinking through, but let's sort of now get on into why stakeholder involvement is important. One of the first things you see when you pick up a lottery application or an application for comic relief is that there's a section on beneficiaries. Before then, they ask you what the aims of objectives or your project is, and then they come to beneficiaries. And then the question they ask you is that, what is the impact of beneficiaries? Normally you have to write out 500 words for your impact on beneficiaries. And then they ask you a series of questions, involvement of people and communities. How, what consultation did you hold? to shape the project? How have you involved beneficiaries in the planning of the project? And how are you going to involve beneficiaries in the day-to-day -day running of the project? And obviously there's a question of evaluation. So you cannot do a successful funding application without the high involvement of your beneficiaries. And I think that this is kind of very important for us to realize that, yes, we can get funds, but in getting the funds, we have to be sure that we are delivering what our beneficiaries want us to, to deliver. And we are doing what our stakeholders actually want us to do. I'm going to veer a little bit into marketing, right? And look at really what this whole issue of how you gain control or really how you involve your stakeholders in a way that works for you as an organization. And the whole process is a process of really marketing which is an active thing, it's not passive. It's about planning, analyzing, identifying the needs of your target group and satisfying those needs with the right services, advertise and publicize in the right medium 
delivered at the most convenient location at an acceptable, acceptable charge for a surplus. Okay. In some of the projects that you would run, because you'll be giving grants, you'll probably not be charging anybody, but it's useful. There are ways of still uh, trying to get some extra money that would help in the uh, sustainability of the, of the organization. Now, part of what we do is social marketing. And social marketing has only one prime objective, which is to achieve a social good and to make an impact on a community. What we do in our marketing is actually making sure that the users who deserve our services are actually matched up with the right services and that we define or devise a way of communicating in an effective way with everybody in the community, with all our publics, with our funders, with people who are even committing, competing against us, where we then are able to enter into collaboration with them. Okay. Strategic marketing is about looking at the pressure that is on you as an organization. And uh, you may be going to your funders and you may have pressure from your users who are, want a, a variety of services that will satisfy their needs. But then there are also issues about people who are offering similar service. And of course, there are new providers. Uh, yesterday, there was a discussion about people having unique products. But what I can, I can bet you is that the day you start providing one service, somebody else will start it if it's going to work for them. So we need to look at some strategy in terms of how we market our services, and as I've said, marketing is about a service, it's about a, a positive, active involvement of our stakeholders. Marketing starts really doing stakeholder analysis. You want to know who the influencer and users are. For some projects, it's not the people who benefit from the project, who pay, so there are influences. And sometimes your competitors turn into collaborators because you are not able to offer all the services. And you need to obviously find out about cost of delivering the services and actually be in tune. What are the funders priorities so that you are able to put forward projects that the funder will, will, uh, will pay for. And so doing, we need to be able to identify the needs of our target groups. Who are users? What service do they really require? When do they require it? How do they require it? Where do they require it? And how much of it do they require? And these finding out about our users is something that is ongoing. We are reviewing them all the time. A lot of people found at the time of COVID that it was such a strange time trying to determine what the, their users really wanted and whether it did within this restrained period, they could actually satisfy their users. So marketing research, as we come out of COVID, we need to be able to go back to our users and find out whether their needs have changed and whether they want our needs to be delivered in a different way in this new normal. The major tools that we use for analyzing our market is to do secondary research, which is uh, the statistics around. I'm working on a project now that um, is problematic and I'm trying to find out the stat democratic statistics are woefully out of date because we are now going to hold this census. So we can't use the census in 2011 any longer. Uh, so I probably now have to deal with more in terms of primary research, focus on the users with questionnaires and focus groups to actually find out 
really who the users are. And the main purpose of doing research on our marketing is to make sure that we are being able to make informed decisions. Are, are we able to forecast demand? Are we going to minimize the risk when we start delivering the project? And how do we allocate resources to the different user groups within our pocket of users? And how do we schedule delivery? Uh, market research helps in terms of that, especially if we are talking to our primary uses of our project. <clears throat> in tradition, mar traditional marketing, that different elements, which looks at products and service, placement and distribution, promotion and advertising, and pricing and cost. Essentially, service is about how you brand, who will use the service, what must we provide, how much of it must we provide. Placement and distribution is about, look, how do people come and access our service? It's really looking at our, our accessibility and our outreach to them. And promotion is, what do we say about what we are doing? What do we say about our product? How are we able to, so to speak, as a friend sell, sell ice to Eskimos in terms of having a valid uh, pro product or service? And pricing and costing is about making sure that you are covering your costs and then having a strategy for determining who is going to use, who is going to pay for your services. Now, we have a formal service, which is a service that is packaged. It's the core service, it's what we offer. Maybe people come to our center, said probably um, a drop-in center, and they come and assess advice and different things. It's branded in a certain way. We know that we offer quality, but, Maybe it's not everybody who comes to the center who needs what it, all that we are offering. Some of them may need more. And augment, augmented services about looking at how you, the word is discriminate, how you discriminate between your different uses, how you are able to offer people services based on geography, age, class, gender, ethnicity, and looking at the severity of people's needs. And if there are any special features about your service. So not everybody gets the same service. For some it's one-on-one, -on -one. for others it's group, for others it's three hours, for others it's five hours. And you need to be able to define all these services and fit them to the different types of clients that you have. And like I said, you need to continue to develop the service to match the changing needs of our users. It's easier to provide a standard service because it's general to all of them. But maybe there are pockets of specialist services that we need to be able to deliver to meet the severe needs of some of our client group, okay. Placing the service is about locational factors. It's about the physical environment. And a lady who runs a church was talking to me the other day and she's saying that she has great difficulty in bringing people in during these COVID days because the risk analysis that she has to do goes into 29 pages and she doesn't think that she's going to be able to open up soon. But we are looking at channels of referral who refer people to this service. Is this other people we know? Is it the local authority? How do we then market to these channels of referral? Accessibility issues are important. Disability issues are important. And so is convenience issues and uh, subcontracting uh, different relationships who can deliver the service in a, in a better way. Most of us have to be flexible when we look at placing the service, because again, there are changing needs of some of the clients as they come in to try and use our service. And pricing the service always comes 
with the concept of a primary user and a secondary user. So when people are taking their children to a daycare center, for instance, it's not the children who make the decision. It's the parent who makes the decision. So any marketing or targeting would have to be done to the parent. Who takes the purchasing decision? There are purchases and there are influences. So if you have an old, older person and they are, uh, their needs need to be taken on board, it's probably a younger person who advocates to them, for them by going to social services and describing really what their needs are. So the purchases are sometimes different from the users. And of course, there are best value issues, which is actually looking at different services to decide what provides more value for money. And full cost recovery, you need to cover all your costs, your setup costs, your direct costs, your overhead costs, and more importantly, your supervision management costs, okay? And then new way of marketing is now about membership. So maybe we don't charge people a fee. Maybe somebody else is paying, but maybe we ask them to be members and maybe pay us a retainer of maybe 10 pounds a year, 20 pounds a year, 50 pounds a year. At least that keeps us, enables us to maybe hire a membership secretary who might be able to look at their needs. And in pricing, we need to talk about affordability. When we run a community organization, we realize that we are normally providing a service for vulnerable, deprived people. So we need to be able to actually formulate a balance between what people can afford and what we can really charge. And we need to make the payment easier. Some of these apply very much to people who set up CICs, because in addition to the grants, they need to go out there and try and generate some income, okay? And promotion is about, really, what do we tell people? The purpose of what we are doing, we need to create awareness. We need to translate that awareness into interest and then the desire and then the action to actually come to us instead of somebody else. And there's a whole communication mix that talks about the content, the medium, and the process of actually ensuring that people are hearing whatever message that you have on board. Who are we and what do we do? Who do we serve? Where and when? How do people contact us? Examples of what we do. Testimony of what we have done. The benefits, the next steps. Typically, we'll find this in a brochure. Most people who do brochures need to answer these questions. And then you talk about the next steps. Come contact us, we'll deliver for you. And I'm talking about a brochure in terms of print, but also, using electronic media to actually talk about who we are. This is the content that we offer people. And then there's a message, which is about service delivery, providing information to our users. And publicity is about doing things that people write about without you having pay, to pay for them. Advertising is about paying for somebody to actually write a copy for you. And again, we talk about it being in print media, but increasingly now it's on um, digital media with people doing Google ads and all the kind of stuff, okay? The message is also a message that can go on to your staff and volunteers, to your sponsors, a message to your members, a message to the general public and a message contained in proposals to your funders. Essentially, you need to think and craft a message that is not only convincing, but is also credible. A message that looks at your organization in good light without necessarily not talking about some of the challenges and problems that you have within the organization. And of course, the media, you are spoiled for choice. 
these days people have television on Facebook. National, local, ethnic directories, exhibitions and fairs, open days, newsletters, posters, brochures. And now we've moved into the social media digital age where a lot of things have gone online and people are fixed to different screens the whole day round, either to their big desktop screens, their laptops, their tablets, and increasingly their phones. And I'm told now those with sophisticated watches are even able to hear the message that community groups are sending to them. And of course, the website, email list, and the report you write about what it is that you are doing. So this is about the medium of sharing your information. Now, I don't know whether you are ready for another exercise, but this could be maybe about five minutes, okay? Essentially, what I want you to do is to go into a group and discuss which media fits which stakeholder. Looking at the message, looking at the content, looking at the media, and looking at the frequency. Now, quite apart from going to groups to actually think about these five minutes, this is something that I want you to live with you so that when you leave this session, you can actually go and sit down and think through what it is that you are doing in terms of connecting with your stakeholders and make sure that you filled it in, okay? Out ask Dara to give us five minutes. And I bet you this will be the last time you go out and talk to your folks, okay? Dara, is that possible? Yeah, I'm gonna open the breakout rooms now. I vary okay. them a bit so you can network with some other people that you might not have spoken to before, so. Okay, great, okay. Are we all back? C can you hear me? Yes, we can uh, hear you. Yeah. Uh, uh, good. Um, yes, we are back. Uh, good. I wasn't too sure if, uh, if it was, everything was so silent. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do, there's a few things um, we're going to um, try and do now for the next half session, next half hour. And we're going to try and pick up on some of the questions coming through. And then we're going to have a feedback, uh, random feedback on some of the groups in terms of your conversation. So um, I'm, I'm giving you prior notice in your groups. We don't know who you are. So if somebody from one, one or two of the groups, and we'll just, just to um, get the conversation going, um, sort of prepare yourself to say a, a little uh, a summary of the conversation you've just had in your group. But before we do that, um, there's a question from Veronica just before you broke, before we broke. Um, asked, would um, Ade comment, could he comment on uh, pubs and betting shops as being part of stakeholder groups? Um, her thought was, I'm thinking of ethical or moral issues here. <laughs> So just as a, a, a feedback, um, Ade, if you've got any thoughts on that. How you see pubs and, and uh, betting shops as stakeholders. Hey, if those people in pubs and the betting shops are likely to be your users, then I think that they are legitimate stakeholders. Uh, let me give you an example. If somebody runs, for instance, a, a center, a luncheon club for older people, okay, really the people you want in that luncheon club are the people who are going to betting shops and the, going into the pubs. Because if your betting, if your luncheon club, for instance, is providing activities for them that would exercise their minds, and activities that will let them keep fit, then really it's important that you are able to drag them from the betting shops and the pubs to actually come and use your services because your services are not just for people who are okay. They are for people who are also really not okay. And probably to use a biblical term, and I don't know um, whether I can, it's about Christ coming to save sinners and not the righteous. 
So in terms of moral issues, I wouldn't think that there are any problems. Thank you. Does that, Thank you. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Sorry, um, Veronica, as a follow up, are there any particular reasons why you raised it or is it just out of curiosity? Uh, um, I, oh, I think, yes, no, I, I was looking at a, uh, an, an park down the road environment issue and looking at not this year, but next year doing something with it. And right next door to it is a pub and a couple of betting shops. And I'm thinking, well, would they be part of the, 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 the people who we'd want as a community group to help with this, to help with this park, et cetera. So, but then I thought, somebody said, oh, betting, you can't have betting people in the betting shop, you know, you can go. So that's why I asked. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> The, the, the reason why I smile um, <laughs> is I presume a lot of it depends on on your organization, the moral value standpoint the organization takes. Um, me personally, I think whatever it takes to get the organization and whatever it takes to get the beneficiaries supported. Um, there are some lines I will draw, but as, as it currently stands, I'm not that particularly concerned about betting shops or bookie, bookies. Oh, right. um, that's, that's, that's me, that's me. Uh, I have no morals. Um, <laughs> but I do think it is something that other people online um, need to be mindful of, is their st stakeholder and how you draw, where you draw the line in terms of your, your stakeholdership, um, because it could have an impact um, in terms of how you're seen and and, and, and who can access your services. So the, the, the underlying question is actually a really good one because it does challenge the organization to think about where it's positioning itself. So it's a very good question, Veronica. Um, <laughs> the other thing I was gonna say, is, okay, um, Daisy, about 10 of our elderly service users go to one, um, one public, I presume it's one pub for our elderly dance club. We send transport to bring them to the center. And again, so you can see another take um, on the scenario. So it depends on where you stand on the, on the situation. I don't think I certainly could have any position to say yes or no. Um, I certainly would say for me, um, my moral standpoint doesn't raise that point. It goes in another direction, um, but others I know it does. So that's two good points. Um, so you've had a chance now to think about the questions you've just um, had a conversation on and, um, and I'll just invite someone from group two. Um, I'm randomly selecting a number. So um, I know who was in group one, so it won't be um, group one. So group two, anyone prepared to say a few words on the conversation you just had in your group? You mean group two? Yeah, here are you want to? Yeah, group two. Help group us. Two. Oh, I was in group two. You was in two. Okay. Oh. oh. Uh, uh, who's speaking, Joseph or? or no, 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 no. Uh, yeah. Student. Student. Okay, student. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, in our group, yes. Uh, I was for uh, for for Zoom. I think Zoom is a very good way of communicating with uh, your stakeholder. Because to me, I find Zoom more flexible. And there's a lot of options when you're using Zoom compared to other social media. And also, it's, it looks good for, for business, even if it's for non-profit, but it looks professional. For, for business people, that, that was my idea. Carl, you're on mute again. Group three, get my fingers up before I get my unmute on. Group three, anyone from group three? Thank you for that student. Hope you don't mind us calling you student. 
Okay, okay, feast. <laughs> Are you on twice? Yes, because I, I logged before oh. my mobile. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay, Feasted. Sorry. Group three. Group three. I think we've got a hand up from group three. So um, light up B-A-H-C. Yeah. Hi. Is light up back? Yeah, I wanted to ask. Actually, this was not what we discussed in our group, but I'm just thinking about it because um, thank you also, Mr. Ade, for that. And thanks, everyone. So what I just wanted to ask is that because when you were doing the talk show, you talked about like uh, the conversation with uh, the stakeholder. Sometimes we'll prepare like a newsletter. You talked about poster. So I just wanted to know regarding the content, what are the contents that needs to go on the newsletter or the poster in order for us to engage our stakeholder? Thank you. Well, um, stakeholder engagement is about, you can actually put anything that you want. Essentially what you want to tell them is that, look, this, uh, this is us and we are open for business and this is what we do. Come join us, come share your ideas with us. And if there are any specific questions, you can actually put on the leaflet or on the poster saying that we want to know your views about this or about that. Okay. When I go on, I'll just talk about feedback because most people offer services and when they offer the services, they need to be able to get feedback instantly at the end of a session that they run. I think if you do that, that's also about something going to your stakeholders. Okay. So really the content is about what you need to be able to analyze, to be able to provide a better service. And if there are any things that you do not quite understand, it's your stakeholders that you go to ask them for them to give you guidance as to what it is that will satisfy them. Thank you for that, thank you. And also, is it possible, can we have like a template, if you don't mind? just to have maybe anyone that you've done before, if we can have that also just to see how we can do that. I think that would be lovely. Thank you so much, Mr. Adi. That's right, thank you. I just, um, I just, just on the back of that, one of the things we're talk we've been talking about is, is sharing and networking. One of the greatest thing about websites, whether you like them or loathe them, they contain a richness <clears throat> of information based around what other people have done. I, once it's public, you can adapt it to suit your needs. And so in terms of a template, I think the best template is what's already out there. Um, and I mean, Andrew is on the line from Croydon BME Forum. And on their website, they've got quite a lot of information, um, projects they've done, research that they've done, and all the other bits and pieces. And I think websites like that contain oodles of information of how different people are communicating with different things. And I'm sure they wouldn't mind um, you pulling down one or two published documents for you to um, um, learn from. And I think it goes right across the board to everyone. Please share, that's why they've got the websites. The websites are, are wonderful template sites. Do you want to say anything, Andrew? I've done chewing on it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Carl, no, thank you so much. Um, yes, I think, Carl's right, because one of the things that we do, so every program that we do, we try to put on there because it's, I use it as a showcase as well, because we know that when funders are looking to fund you, one of the things that they do is actually go on your website to kind of see, um, you know, if what you're putting down on, on paper is actually what you're actually doing as well. So, um, so, so that's why we like advertising our projects and our reports that we do on our website. And it's also good for, for, um, for bid writers as well, because, um, you know, you can just tell them, just go on our website and read up more about us as well, because there's some stuff that as a director or CEO, we would always forget because it might have been years ago. But if a bid writer goes on this, ah, oh, this is very helpful to put into a bid as well. So, yeah, I agree with our websites are, are something very, very, very useful. Unmute. Thank you for that, Andrew. I know you weren't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, 
Any, any other questions? So that was group three, about group four, group four, any feedback on group four? Okay. Group four? I'm not from that group, but because some nobody's talking. I can, uh, I can... In group four, we had um, Raheem, we had Tottenham Food Bank, we had Veronica. Oh. Anyone from that cluster want to say something? All right, I'll say I thought I talk too much, so I usually <laughs> stay mute and let other people go. Um, we had a variety of stuff because I'm an older person. I'm not so much on social social media, but I would certainly use a mixture of of, of the various old fashioned survey focus group and. Um, email. So it depends on thing because I do know lots of older people like myself. I am using Zoom now and I have learned to use it during lockdown, but a lot of what some of our elderly people are not that keen on it. So I would tend to do a mixture of those and let the younger people do the WhatsApp and the, uh, and the other things. Carl, you're muted. Takes so long for this thing to unmute. Um, so that was group four. Um, anybody else? Fiston, you want to just come in? Come in and, and say your bit. Here we go. Until hey. somebody else comes forward. Thank you for the, the word. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask Aid a question. So I would like to know whether uh, it's good to give a negative feedback to someone immediately? If it is yes, is there any specific way of doing it so that's not to verse the person who is receiving the negative feedback? Yeah, I think negative feedback are a useful way of getting people to actually improve their services. There's no need to tell everybody that. I mean, the person delivering the service should themselves know at some stage when they haven't done very well. I mean, I do a lot of consulting and I do a lot of training. And there are some places where I go to and I know that oh, today was not as good as it could have been. So essentially what I'm saying is that when you tell somebody, you know, that's really what it, it's not just compliments all the time. Sometimes it should also be about complaints and telling them that, look, I didn't like this and I didn't like this and I didn't like that. So there's no, you don't have to make it publicly, but you can call them aside and tell them that, look, I didn't like this. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that's actually very good because next time they won't do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, the, the other thing just to, um, add to that. A lot of people think that negative, what is perceived to be negative um, feedback is actually a bad thing. One of the things um, funders in particular, especially a big lottery, um, is very keen on. They're not the only one, but I know they're particularly keen on. Esme Fairburn is another one. They're keen on where there are barriers, challenges that the organization has had to face and they want to see how you, you met those challenge. So those negative feedbacks, depending what they are and how they're framed, actually could be a plus. So don't believe that all feedback has to be of a particular type in terms of glowing. It could point to not necessarily a deficit, but it could point to a challenge. And then you could then say how you met that challenge because they're more imp what they say is they're more interested in the lessons learned than about the achievement because they believe it's never uniform. And so they want to see that. Sorry, but Deborah, you're about to come in. Oh, no, sorry. I just wanted to just, uh, on the back of that, I just wanted to say that, yes, that is definitely true. I mean, a good example I normally give people is um, like, for instance, they might have put in the bid, oh, we're going to recruit 120 people. But in fact, they only recruited 50. But that's and they think, oh, no, we can't say that. But actually, you can and you should. 
because it might be that those 50 people that you did recruit had such high support needs that actually 50 was relevant to the particular project. And you're showing the funders how you managed to work with those 50 with the high support needs and how you help them overcome their challenges and barriers and help them move on and achieve some and achieve some uh, outcomes for themselves. So, yes, it, it should be, you know, but like I said, a good, you know, um, evaluator or somebody looking at it can mitigate for all of that. But you should let them know about the things that you have had on the project that you've had to overcome as well. Okay. Joseph. Yeah, just to add to, to that, in fact, uh, some funders will ask, what are the challenges you anticipate in, in this project and how are you going to overcome it? So that also is, is you know, <laughs> that's, that's not just feedback now, but even saying, look, we, we know you probably, you, you're probably going to have some problems and what do you think they, they will be? And how do you, will you uh, overcome them if they occur? So um, negative, they say, it, it depends on how you couch it. Um, if you don't couch it in a state, in, in a way that makes you look hopeless, <laughs> uh, that look, if you give us this money, well, it's just going to go down the waste. What? Then, then um, I think they take it um, as, um, as being honest and being upfront. Uh, you know, so I, I mean, that, that's just uh, what I want to add to it. Thank you. Okay, um, group five, was there someone from group five? Uh, I think it was only five groups, so I'm hoping I'm, I'm right. Group five, who haven't we heard from yet? Group five, don't be shy, you're amongst friends. We only had um, four groups. Four groups, okay then. Um, any, any other questions to um, that? That, uh, that came out of your broad conversation in the, in the three breakout rooms that you, you feel you'd either want to share or, or, or ask Ed, Eddie um, around stakeholder engagement. Anything that he raised? Um, we, we didn't actually raise this at the, at the, at the, at the group, but uh, I just felt um, it to be good for group to look at, uh, which means best suits them and stick to it because there's so many means there. There's Facebook, Handbook, Legbook, all sorts of uh, Twitter, all sorts of uh, means. And if you are not careful, you just find yourself um, into the, uh, jump into the sea of, uh, of media, social media, and you're, you're, you're carried away. So it, it, maybe you want to look at two, three, four various uh, 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 social media and choose the one that best suits. For instance, if you are a youth organization working for you, then you want to look that and, and if you, which one suits your audience and, and your stakeholders. And if it's elderly club you are running, uh, and you know, and things like that. that. That's just what I want to uh, suggest to, to the discussion. Yeah. Oh, can I just ask one question? One yeah. question. Um, how many people online have undertaken some form of engagement process in the last six months, over the last six months? However you wish to define it, whether it's um, surveys, one-to-one -one conversation, focus group, um, anything. In the last six months, how many of you online have actually undertaken some form of, I don't want to know how many, but just some form of, um, if you just put your hand up on the using the, and thingy jigs, just to get a, a, a poll. Um, you know, on the, you've got your and signal, I think one of these reactions or whatever it is. Here we go, that's one, two, three. On my screen, I can only see three ands. Um, Veronica, four, five, six. Okay, and there's 20 of us, six, seven. Okay, there's a, just under half. Thanks for that. I, I, I thought it would be useful just, just to get a sense of um, the, yeah, the engagement process. As it is. So just under half from what I, uh, a quick look across my screen. 
um, I've undertaken it over the last six months. Okay, Ade. Well, just sort of trying to wind down, maybe if I just share my last screen, okay? <clears throat> if that is... Um, Um, when I started out in talking about the stakeholders, I had the members outside this box of the community. By the time you finish your stakeholder involvement, you should have all the different USAC groups, all the different stakeholder group within your organization. So by the different methods that uh, you use in terms of bringing the stakeholders towards you, you start from having your stakeholders far apart from you into having your stakeholders all within you, within your organization. So it means that your organization has all the information and all the data to make good applications, to run successful projects and programs, and to be able to leave its stakeholder groups very satisfied about what it is that they have done. So this will well end here. And I would ask for the last question and if there's anything, okay. Carl, over to you. So I'm gonna leave the last words to you guys online. Any, any <laughs> thoughts, any, any, it's about two minutes before five. Um, any questions? Okay, Vanessa's got one. Okay, Vanessa, you wanna um, open your mic and um, I'll let you have a conversation with Eddie. Hello, Ade. Hi. I um, just really um, enjoyed the class and trying to interpret how to better engage with my stakeholders. And I'm going to take some time to, to um, draw them out just in the words, which you've shown us a very simple way of doing. I wanted to ask a simple question, but I mean it. It's an awkward one, but should we show love and appreciation to our stakeholders once we know who they are? And should it be bespoke to each of them according to what they contribute to, um, yeah, to the community that we all have? Yes, actually, to all your stakeholders, because essentially what you are trying to do is, even if you are working with a, a funder, yeah. you want to part, you want to pan, partner that funder, because mm -hmm. the reason why that funder wants to fund a project that you are engaged in is because. Yeah you all want to do what I call social good. Mm. And so, yes, you need to be, embrace them uh, okay. and, and recognize them. Yes, and also point out the things that they do well, um, yeah. That they are also coming in there to partner you. And for all your stakeholders, it's really more about partnership because it's really partnership that allows people to be able to deliver efficient services, effective services, and also to be economical in terms of what they deliver. I'm just gonna add that because of class, I'm a lot more confident. The other day I bought a 3D printer and from China didn't realize it was coming with shipping costs. And I messaged the seller and I said, look, this is not gonna work out for us. It's costing double the price. <laughs> Do not send me this item. But the item had already arrived, it was going to arrive. And I instead convinced them to make me, to become my tech innovation partner. I'll okay. let you know how that goes. But because of these classes, I am able to have more meaningful conversations and be a lot braver in asking for things and finding opportunities where, in this case, I was going to be in a lot of trouble. So I just wanted to thank um, yourself, Carl, and everyone who's come in to teach us thank for you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, um, there's a question um, from Dadie Somali uh, Community Association. She, yeah. The question was suppliers, who are they? Uh, who are the suppliers? I, I presume it depends on your 
organization and yeah. what you're reaching for? Suppliers are people who you buy products from, essentially. But there are also people who, who are, may be able to help you to actually deliver a service. So depending on, I know you're doing a lot of advocacy work, okay? So your suppliers could actually be even people who refer people to you, okay? Is that, does that answer you? She speaks. Yes, yes she said, okay. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Th thanks. And then just before we go, just to pick up on Vanessa's point, and it's about, it's a really good point that may have missed the, the mark, which is opportunism. Yeah. We talked about negative feedback, but here was a negative situation. And, um, and Vanessa was able to turn that negative situation into a potential positive scenario. Yeah. And I think that's one of the hallmark here is that sometimes being brave in terms of um, perhaps let's call it being having a front, a cheeky front. And, 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 and you just don't know what, what might, might emerge. And just by asking the question, yeah. I mean, they've got one or two choices. They could either say yes or no. Um, and, and so ask the question. Put the situation there and see what emerges out of it. And out of it is coming a conversation. And I think that's, that, that's a real positive thing. I didn't get a chance to sort of follow that up then because I wanted to get another question in. But I think it is really critical that we look at opportunities um, and sometimes the opportunities don't always present themselves in the way we think they will. And that's the beauty of opportunism. And, and they always say fortune favors the brave and sometimes, and that's what opportunism is about. So mm. hold on to some of those as you go forward. Yeah, I agree with that. Carl, are you having the last word in terms of widening down? In terms I will. Of steps? I, I yeah. will do. Okay, keep going. No more. Okay, sorry about this. We get the we <laughs> <laughs> no. technology sinking. Um, thank you, Ade, um, for your session and for engaging us in this. It is one of those things that will be ongoing because as we learn, as we get confident, as we grow, as we partner with people, um, we become confident in, in, in reaching out. And, and that's the key um, that underpins this. And it suffices it from us to say at the team, thank you once again. I was gonna say safe journey home, but I think that's a, <laughs> that's a stale joke now. So um, thank you for coming on and we'll catch up next week.